All right. <clears throat> Welcome to the Solar Dynamics webinar series. Uh, today, so my name is Blake Anson. I'm the product manager for the iCell Cardiomyocytes. And today's webinar will be led by Eric Chow, um, who's the head of the non-clinical safety stem cell unit at Hoffman LaRoche. Now, Eric's topic will be utilizing stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes for early safety screening. The webinar uh, will go something like this. We're going to have a few slides on technical logistics. This is basically how to ask questions and how we'll answer them. Um, then I will give a brief overview on cellular dynamics as well as the ISL cardiomyocyte product. And then Dr. Chow will give his talk on the using the cardiomyocytes for early drug safety assessments. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, the way to ask questions is to center your cursor uh, near the top of the screen to activate the interface bar. That will open up a text box. You can type your question in there and press send, and we'll answer the questions as, as many as we can. We won't be able to answer any questions during the webinar. Instead, we'll just um, do it during a question answer period at the end. All right, with that taken care of, let me, uh, um, for those of you who don't know cellular dynamics, let me introduce you to us. We believe we're the world's largest producer of human iPS cells and iPS cell derived types, so the, the tissue cell types that can be derived from uh, iPS cells. We currently employ around 107 people at our uh, headquarters in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we've got a 30,000 square foot facility with dedicated R&D space, dedicated production space, as well as commercial and administrative space as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got three core competencies, and that's really centered around IPS technology and differentiating cells from, from them. Um, the first competency is really the creation and culture of human IPS cells. This is the reprogramming and maintaining of these various stem cell lines. Uh, second aspect is the genetic engineering of the reprogrammed cells, IPS cells. And this genetic programming can include inserting um, markers or selection, uh, selection markers to help differentiate particular cell types, be it cardiomyocytes, hepatocytes, neurons, et cetera, as well as markers to um, illustrate when certain pathways or gene products are being transcribed and translated. This really gives one power to use these cells in screening types that a screening and paradigm that not, have not been accessible uh, to date. And then last but not least is the manufacture of the human iPS cell um, uh, tissue types. So we've generated an industrial platform that is easily adaptable for the creation of many different cell types. And as you can see from our product list, um, we've adapted that procedure to generate cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and neurons. Um, these are all three launched products that are, are really readily available in inventory. And we've also got a hepatocyte project that is in development and currently in use by early access customers. And our fifth product offering here is uh, something new. That is the MyCell Custom IPS Services. And this is a, 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 pair, a, a program whereby we will reprogram customer-provided samples. So if customers have samples from interesting phenotypes, patients, or events, we will reprogram those cells, create these cell lines, and then do any associated engineering with that and differentiate them into the appropriate cell lines. And then last but definitely not least, we've got a full commercial team with international distribution. Um, the commercial team plays a very important role in that it not only provides um, a way for the customers to access the products, we've also got an application and technical support team that can help develop applications and really ensure the success of the customer with the cells. Moving on to the iCell cardiomyocyte product, um, these are, as I'm sure you've surmised, human iPS cell derived, highly pure and ready to use. We, they, are, they will arrive as cryopreserved vials of cells. Each vial will contain uh, 1.5 million dissociated, 1.5 million platable cells that have been dissociated, ready for thaw, and ready for um, plating them into any type of appropriate cell culture vessel. Um, it's a full product solution that we provide. So it's the cells, the media, 
a basic user's guide, and then a variety of application-specific protocols. Um, as we'll see in this seminar, this webinar, um, they demonstrate really the full human cardiac biology, appropriate electrophysiology, and uh, toxicity responses. And I'll end my talk on a slide that just briefly touches on really the broad platform utility of these cells. I've got a couple of slides of uh, basic characterization um, that is meant to complement what Dr. Chow will be presenting. Here in this slide, we see an electrophysiological characterization of the cardiomyocytes performed with manual patch clamp. Over on the left-hand side, we can see that the cells um, express the requisite currents that one would expect from a cardiomyocyte. The depolarizing sodium and calcium currents, repolarizing ITO, transient potassium current, and IKR, otherwise known as HERG, as well as the funny current, which maintains that automaticity, and IK1, which sets that maximum diastolic potential or that repolarization potential. The sum effect of these currents is the generation of spontaneous action potentials. This is a pan cardiac population, and so each vial will contain a mixture of cardiac cardiomyocyte subtypes uh, expressed as atrial like, nodal like, and ventricular like. The primary differentiator being the duration of the ventricular cells and the presence of a plateau like feature. All right, and then last but not least here is the presence of the um, expected GPCR pathways, looking at the beta adrenergic, alpha adrenergic, and muscarinic pathways. So all in all, we've got the appropriate electrophysiological and biochemical um, uh, components of the cells. Um, two other aspects I'm going to touch on briefly is the energy production of the cells. They use the mitochondria, as evidenced by experiments done with seahorse bioscience. And also we've got physiological contraction. That is, contraction here is dependent upon calcium transients and can be a measure on a variety of platforms. So what we've got here then is really fully functional cardiomyocytes. Um, and we've engineered these such that they're able to be used on a wide variety of platforms. So any type of the cell-based assays um, that you can use a cell line on, you can use the cardiomyocytes on. And we've got application notes um, with one of our co-marketing partners, uh, Promega, that shows that these cells can be used in just a wide variety of their assays. We can use these cells on high content imaging. Here we just see a brief example looking at mitochondrial toxicity. Um, we already saw uh, the seahorse biosciences to look at my, uh, energetics. We've also used these cells with, uh, to look at calcium handling with the flipper system with molecular devices, a variety of automated patch clamp modalities, and then as uh, we uh, saw earlier, contraction via the ion optics. So as you can see, we've got really fully functional human cells that really give an unprecedented access to this biology early on in the screening process or the drug discovery process. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chow, who will talk to us about the human IPSC cardiomyocytes for early drug safety assessments. Uh, Dr. Chow, take it away. All right, thanks, Blake. Yeah, I, I don't have control yet. should have it now. Great. So, um, just an overview of uh, the talk. I'll start with a, a brief introduction to um, really our lab here at uh, Roche uh, in Nutley, New Jersey. And then the meat of the talk will really be uh, our work using these uh, IPS cell-derived cardiomyocytes to develop an assay for early drug safety uh, assessments. And then I'll end with just very briefly some, some thoughts on uh, future uses and, and questions to address. So uh, I came to Roche about a, a year and a half ago to set up a new lab in non-clinical safety. The, the vision was really to try and directly address this uh, idea put forth by the National Academy of Sciences in 2007, and that is uh, an effort to transform the traditional toxicity that typically relied on animal models into something that relied more heavily on in vitro models, preferably um, cells of a human origin. 
And the idea is that um, hopefully by using human cells, we would have uh, assays that were more predictive of human responses, um, but also to reduce uh, animal use and drug discovery costs. Um, so I'm in the early investigative safety group at Roche, and, and the idea behind this is that during drug development, when you start looking for a new drug for a specific indication in the beginning of the game, you have a lot of different potential compounds, and, and the investment that you've put in is, is minimal. But as time goes on, you, you narrow down the number of compounds, and the cost and investment increases. Once you enter into GLP studies, the costs, of course, become ex uh, very expensive. So our early investigative safety group is um, focused on trying to um, choose better candidates early on uh, in the drug development process. Um, so the idea with our lab in particular is to develop and implement uh, stem cell-based assays to improve this whole process, the selection. And uh, we're targeting the, the primary uh, organs that where you see toxicity, um, drug-induced toxicity, which are, of course, uh, the heart and the liver. Um, so before I get into the, the meat of the talk, uh, just to sort of set the stage, um, when I was at a recent meeting, uh, really asking the question is, what does Big Pharma need to do to implement stem, cell, uh, stem cells in drug development? There was an interesting point brought up uh, by uh, Leanne Karen from Genzyme, and she was actually uh, discussing within the context of using um, cell therapies, but it applies really to what we're doing here. And the idea is that you know, any new product or assay um, has to compete against the existing uh, paradigms. So for what we're doing, we have to be aware that new assays are going to need to compete against the traditional practices. And, and really, the only way for them to be valuable is that they have to meet an unmet need. And particularly for what we're trying to do, we, we really want to find assays that provide novel functionality. And then beyond that, in order to gain acceptance and uh, industry and regulatory acceptance, we need to inform uh, people, the, the scientific field, and by things like this and also by publishing. Uh, and I think that our work that we've done in the past uh, year and a half is a, a very nice example of, of the idea that you know, big pharma and biotech, when partnering together, can actually achieve things uh, in a very effective way. So. Um, I'll move on now to the meat where we talk about how we use these cells and, and really the, the evolution of the arrhythmia assay. So just a general background, uh, most of you probably know that uh, as you see up top, this is the standard uh, ECG waveform that people uh, measure in the electrical currents and heart. And we know that historically, if you have an elongation of what's called the QT interval, which is like the little bump before the large peak and then this T peak here, that can lead to uh, arrhythmia. And the, um, the uh, standard or, or most widely uh, observed is the torsades to point. And this can, of course, lead to uh, uncontrolled ventricular fibrillation. This is the point where typically uh, the the paramedics would have the defibrillator and try and reset the electrical currents. And the, the primary concern is if uh, this can lead to a sudden death. So we know that um, inhibiting a single ion channel, the HERD channel, can lead to uh, prolongation of this QT interval. And this, in turn, can lead to arrhythmias. Um, and we know uh, historically that QT prolongation and arrhythmia is, has been the number one cause of uh, withdrawal of drugs on the market um, from the late 90s to the uh, early 2000s. So as a consequence, the FDA has mandated uh, several uh, tests. And, and the most widely used is in early safety screening is a uh, patch clamp for uh, inhibition of the HERG channel. So what this is is um, basically tumor cells that are overexpressing this one channel, the human etherogogo channel, 
and uh, you test to see whether your compound can inhibit um, current flux across that channel. And, and this is really the the main uh, early safety assay that we have that's in vitro. Beyond that, there are there are a variety of other um, sort of ex vivo like the hamster Langendorf assay, which we employ here at Roche. Uh, but then you really go into in vivo uh, studies. Um, the problem is that we know that not all compounds that inhibit the herd channel will actually cause QT prolongation or arrhythmias. And not all compounds that even cause pre, uh, QT prolongation will cause arrhythmias. And that the preclinical animals don't always predict what happens in humans. And this isn't really surprising because the coordinated beating of the heart is uh, relies on not a single channel, the HERG channel, but a whole host of channels. So there are many different ways that you can cause arrhythmias, and there are ways to compensate for um, inhibition of a single channel. So basically, we know that although the HERG assay is very useful and powerful and can be very predictive, it's not 100% um, predictive, so there is room for improvement. Um, so this talk really will describe bringing together uh, two new tools, and one is, of course, the ITSL drive human cardiomyocytes, and then the other is this uh, platform that we use to measure the function of the cardiomyocytes. So um, I'm going to describe sort of just briefly both these two components in terms of uh, the science and then how we uh, integrated them to come up with the assay. So uh, actually, before I came to Roche, um, Roche had been working with CDI to characterize these IPSL-derived human cardiomyocytes. And as uh, Blake has already uh, mentioned, when they did patch clamp on populations of the ISL cardiomyocytes, they were able to show that you have uh, both all three major types of cardiomyocytes, ventricular, atrial, and nodal. And this was done by uh, looking at the uh, electrophysiological waveform by patch plan. And uh, by immunostaining, we see that they express the various uh, proteins that are involved in cardiomyocyte function. Uh, we actually worked with them and, and did a, a broad gene expression analysis uh, of the cells throughout differentiation. So what you see here is on the x-axis the um, the days that the cells have been differentiated. So zero is essentially undifferentiated cells. And then on the y-axis is the correlation coefficient with human heart samples. And these are a variety of different heart samples from fetal uh, left ventricular from different vendors. And what you see is obviously in the beginning when they're undifferentiated, they're, they're not correlated very uh, strongly at all. And then very rapidly, within 20 or 24 days, they uh, have a very high degree of correlation. And then through an extended culture, they have a very stable expression phenotype, but it, they continue to uh, approach uh, or the correlation gets closer and closer to that in adult uh, heart cells. In contrast, when we did the same sort of analysis with primary cardiomyocytes um, that were from uh, cadaverous tissue, or basically you take live uh, cardiomyocytes and they're dissociated, and when you plate them out, they are, have essentially a 0.1 uh, score, R squared score, so they're not, they don't resemble the actual uh, in vivo tissue hardly at all. Um, as a side note, we actually took this data and extrapolated it out to say when would uh, the IPS cells, if we maintain them in culture, how long would it take for them to converge and be 100% uh, correlated with uh, the adult tissue? And it was about two years, um, which I thought was sort of interesting. So the second enabling technology was something that um, we were that was developed from Roche Applied Sciences, which is a, a separate group in uh, Pennsburg. And this is called the uh, Excelgen system. And what this is is a 96-well-based uh, 
system that measures impedance across the surface of each well. So you have a 96 well plate, and on the bottom of each well are these gold electrodes that snake all the way across the surface of the plate. And then they have electrical current that is applied across that, and it, they detect and measure the impedance across the surface of the well. So what happens is that if you have uh, nothing, just media on here, the impedance levels are really low. If you have uh, more cells, you increase the impedance levels. And if the cells are more strongly attached, strongly adhered to the surface of the well, then the impedance is even higher. Um, and this system has been around for a while. Um, primarily, it was used just to get an idea as to whether or not you have cells on, on the bottom of the dish. So it was used as a non-invasive way to uh, look at what they call a cell index, how many cells are, are basically sitting at the bottom of your well. Um, when we started working, so this sort of uh, demonstrates if you have uh, cells here, you have a cell index of one, and if you treat with a toxic compound, the cell index will fall as the cells die, and you have fewer on the uh, bottom of the well. Um, when we started working with the cardiomyocytes, though, we, we were able to do alpha testing for a new generation of this impedance measuring system where they increased the sampling rate. So the, the frequency, how fast they were able to measure and take that impedance measurement. So the traditional system, you would look at over hours and you get this cell index. With this new increased sampling rate, we're able to look at a much uh, higher resolution. So we're looking at things uh, over fractions of a second. And when we played it down, the cardiomyocytes, and we used this, this new system, we saw the following. We saw what looked like a regular periodic uh, pattern changing in the impedance measurements. And we interpreted this to be a reflection of the rhythmic beating of the cells on the surface of the well. Um, so we wanted, because this is essentially a new technology, new cells, we asked the question is, are these changing uh, impedance measurements that we're um, observing, are they actually reflecting the physical beating of the cells, or is it um, essentially like feedback or noise uh, from the electrical changes? So what you see here is the typical readout we get from the plate. Each of these rows um, corresponds to an individual well on the plate. Um, so this would be like uh, well A1, and this would be A2, A3, uh, and we have a confluent monolayer of the cardiomyocytes on the surface of each well. So um, we would have a pre-drug treatment. We measure the regular beating, and then we start off by doing the following. We treat it with a compound, uh, bledestatin, that blocks myosin in the actin detached state. So when this happened, with increasing concentrations of bledestatin, we saw a disruption of this regular beating pattern. In parallel, we had the same cells treated with bledestatin, but uh, measuring by microelectrode arrays. So here, we're looking at the um, changing electrical currents in the cells. And by MEA, we didn't see any changes because blood is sad and it, it doesn't change the, um, the current fluxing across the ion channels. It only prevents the, the myosin and actin from interacting. So these experiments supported, strongly supported the hypothesis that what we were seeing with the impedance was actually the physical movement of the cells on the bottom of the uh, well and not uh, the electrical current being uh, uh, switching across the cell membrane. Um, so we went on um, and looked at other drugs that affect various channels involved in uh, cardiac function, sodium channel blockers, pacemaker current blockers, um, and uh, beta adrenergic uh, receptors. And, and we saw essentially what we would expect, and that when you uh, add the drug, 
So we would take measurements by impedance uh, in a single well and then add either a control or our, our compounds. We saw Uh, the expected mirrored by the electrical measurements detected by MEA. So, like, uh, teratotoxin uh, decreased the beat rate both by impedance and by MEA, and extraparteranol, we saw an increase in the beat rate both by impedance and MEA. So, that gave us confidence that what we're seeing uh, with the impedance measurements was a, a, a real bona fide effect. And, uh, and additionally, that these cells had these functional channels that um, are required for uh, normal cardiac function. Um, then uh, we did the following experiment where we used a commonly used compound, E4031, which blocks the HER channel. And we, we saw the following. If we uh, had a well treated with DMSO and then an adjacent well with the, the drug, we saw these little subbeats, a disruption of the normal regular beating pattern, and we saw these little subbeats that resembled what we interpreted as uh, arrhythmic beating. Um, and once again, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't some sort of um, noise effect in the impedance measurement. So we, we had the following hypothesis that um, if this was a true arrhythmia, functional arrhythmia in a cardiomyocyte, by blocking uh, the HER channel, we may be able to rescue it in a way that was used uh, at one point in the clinic by doing a, a compensatory blocking of the calcium channel with nifedipine. Um, so and that's exactly what we did. And you can see uh, in, in this column, this is the exact same well. Uh, it was originally treated with E4031. We saw the induction of these small little beads and then we added nifedipine, and it returned to the regular beating. Um, we actually were able to use an internal compound that we knew caused arrhythmia in animals and, and recapitulate the same finding, where if we added the compound that we knew caused arrhythmia, we'd see these little irregular beats. And then if we added nifedipine, we could rescue these regular beats. So we had a uh, indication that we could functionally rescue the drug-induced arrhythmia in a way that you would predict if, if uh, these effects that we're observing uh, by impedance were a, a bona fide arrhythmia due to inhibition of the uh, cardiac ion channels. So um, we wanted to translate this from a, a qualitative measure into a quantitative measure. And, and for this, uh, so once again, this is basically the system that we use. This subunit goes in, this part of the instrument goes into the incubator. We have a 96 well dish, and we have cells on the bottom of each well, and we can measure the impedance. And then if we look at uh, a very uh, narrow uh, or fast impedance measurement, so over seconds we can see these regular beats. I have to say we have a movie here. Um, because of the internet latency, it won't really tr translate see it normally. But this is of a single well, pre-drug, um, and you can see the cells beating. And what we do is, um, and then we change the media and add the drug. Um, the movie will actually um, transition into the same well with uh, E4031. And the regular beating pattern that we normally detect once we add E4031 um, we actually will see irregular beating. And uh, once again, because of the internet, you won't have the same feeling for the regular beating pattern versus the normal beating pattern, but I think CDI is going to make this movie available on their website. So I encourage you, if you want to see it, it, it will demonstrate, I think, pretty um, clearly the difference between the pre-drug and the E4031. When you have E4031, E4031, you'll see not the regular beating pattern, but an uh, irregular pattern with some other small little subbeats that come up. And, and this is what we observed in the 
uh, impedance measurements. So to, to translate this from sort of qualitative into a quantitative measure, um, we came up with the following, and, and this was really empirically uh, determined the irregular beat, IB20, and this is the lowest concentration of the compound that that results in 20% irregular beats. And we count the irregular beats as being these little sub-beats, not the full sweep down to the bottom, but these guys here with the red uh, arrowhead. So when we have 20% of the sub-beats versus the regular beat over a period of a minute, the concentration of drug that gives us that is the IB20. Um, so using this metric, we um, tested 23 commercially available compounds that we, the in vivo effect was in humans, in the clinic. And um, from this uh, validation data set, we came up with a threshold of 30 micromolar for the IB20 that um, could distinguish compounds that caused arrhythmia in humans and compounds that didn't. Um, we had one false positive and no false negatives. Um, what's nice is that in this data set, we had compound QT prolongation and yet cause arrhythmia in the clinic. And what's equally nice, and especially in terms of early uh, safety assessment, there are compounds that did inhibit her but were clean in the uh, clinic, so they didn't cause arrhythmia in, in humans. So um, this demonstrates that this method can detect um, or properly identify what would have been false positives if you look at HERG screening only, as well as false negatives. So next we went on to try and um, uh, expand this validation set with uh, compounds that were used internally at Roche where we knew uh, what the in vivo findings were in terms of animal telemetry studies. So these are ECG studies. They're not necessarily um, geared to determine whether or not you cause uh, torsades, so whether or not you have arrhythmia. But we get, um, we detect uh, abnormal ECG findings. We also have hemodynamic findings. And we found uh, that using the same metrics, the IB20 with a, a cutoff of 30 micromolar, we had no false positives. Um, but we saw very quickly that we didn't detect some things. Um, we didn't find uh, detect compounds that had isolated changes in heart rate or blood pressure, which isn't really all that um, surprising because there are many different ways to change blood pressure or heart rate that don't rely simply on the, the contraction of the cardiomyocytes. Um, and also, we did not detect uh, compounds that had uh, particularly affected other components of the ECG, like the PR interval or the QRS interval. Um, but we still were able to identify compounds that had uh, strong or, or borderline HERG signals, um, but were clean as far as in vivo ECG. Um, so we, we don't actually know with, with these compounds, which we call false negatives, whether or not in humans they would actually cause arrhythmia, um, and we, it's not really realistic to take these exploratory compounds and, and do invest in them and see whether or not they would in people. Um, but after some discussion, we, we decided that it, it, although these compounds may not actually cause arrhythmia in people, it still is for early safety screening not acceptable to maintain uh, that number of false uh, negatives. So we went back and, and reassessed the data that we were collecting from uh, the impedance measurements, and we came up with a, a new metric, which we call the delta BR20. And this is the lowest concentration of drug that uh, results in a 20% uh, reduction in beat rate. It's actually a 20% change in beat rate. Um, it can either be increase or reduction. And once again, empirically, we um, came upon a 30 micromolar threshold as being informative. And uh, using this metric, we actually correctly identified this whole block that the irregular B um, metric uh, missed. So
So at this point, we had no false negatives, but we did pick up two false positives. Um, but um, as I said, after some discussion internally, we decided that if you had an early drug candidate and it had an ECG finding in vivo um, in animals, it would be hard to progress it. So we sort of prefer this sort of conservative uh, metric to uh, provide better predictivity. And what is nice is that we still maintain the uh, correct identification of compounds that had borderline or positive HERG um, signals, depending on where you set your threshold, and yet we're clean in, vi in vivo. Um, so in, in total, our, we validated using 51 compounds, uh, about half of them commercially available and half of them uh, internal compounds, and put together when we use both the uh, regular beat and uh, the regular beat and the beat rate metrics, um, we have an accuracy of 90 percent. Um, there, there is one caveat. So I should say we, we've published the original validation set with the uh, commercially available compounds in Toxi, and when we did that work, we uh, used I think uh, like two or three independent lots of the cardiomyocytes. And uh, during that work, we always saw a very uh, consistent downward beating pattern. When we started expanding to use um, this assay for internal screening, uh, however, we saw the following uh, difference. So when we do the assay, what we would do is we would plate the cells uh, in the 96 well, and we would measure the impedance uh, and we let them sit there for three days to stabilize their beat rate. And then we would typically add compound and, and take uh, impedance measurements for 72 hours, and then we terminate the study. Um, what we found is that with some lots of cells using this protocol, the untreated cells would actually change in their the waveform pattern of impedance. So um, while some lots would maintain the same downward beating pattern for the duration of the study, other lots would actually switch. As you see in these guys, they start beating downward when we first play them, but at the end of the seven days, they're beating upward regularly. So for us, um, it's not really clear whether a downward beating pattern or an upward beating pattern is better. In the end, uh, we sort of think that either one, as long as it's regular and we can have the same uh, drug effect at the same concentrations, is fine. But for our assays we're using right now, we can't essentially have it move from downward beating to upward beating right mid-assay. So we have a very simple solution right now. Uh, temporarily, we just identified the lots that give us the downward beating pattern for the duration that we need. And we've been working with CDI um, to further refine the assay, figure out exactly, you know, does it make a difference? Can we have upward beating or downward beating? Um, and as well as with Rush Applied Sciences for other components of, of really how we measure the impedance and, and what the, uh, let's say, plating conditions are. Um, so in summary, uh, we feel that this new assay is very exciting because it, it's essentially a new in vitro functionality. We have for the first time human cardiomyocytes that we can play in a, a high throughput way and have reproducibility and importantly it has a new functionality that uh, we can identify compounds that inhibit HERG in vitro but have normal ECGs in vivo and vice versa. Um, for early safety screening it's important that we have quantitative data so we can uh, come up with historical measures that um, uh, have high predictivity and it's high throughput, uh, so minimal compound uh, requirements, which again is important for early safety screening when the chemists uh, are, are just starting and they don't want to invest a lot of resources to make a lot of compound. And we've actually begun to use this internally for uh, drug discovery support. Um, so just, uh, I think, one more slide on uh, future Alex. So sort of going back to what I started with, uh, the new assays must have a meet-unmet need, 
novel functionality. Um, so some of the things that we, we still have to address are, is how far we can push this assay. We, we really only have, have looked at the, the beat rate and it's probably one of the, the easiest forms, the inhibition of uh, or the change in the beat rate or the uh, appearance of the irregular beats. Um, I think that if we have more uh, sophisticated software, we can probably find out much more biology in there. Um, in addition, we haven't really worked too hard to push the assay throughput because um, it's, it's uh, essentially a new assay we're using um, for uh, in a limited way in, in early safety assessments. Um, but our ultimate goal is to actually um, work with other farmer partners to generate a large uh, data set that someday we hope to um, bring forward to the FDA and see if we can actually use an assay like this to replace uh, animal studies, which is something that we all talk about, but rarely has it really happened where we come up with a, a new in vitro assay that uh, replaces. The other possibility that we, we talk about, we haven't worked, we haven't worked with too much in-house is uh, what other endpoints can we uh, look at that would provide value from a drug discovery or safety perspective. And one of the obvious things uh, is whether or not we can detect uh, a hypertrophic response with the cardiomyocytes. We, we did a little work in it with it. I know that um, other people at uh, the CDI has done more work on it. Um, and then the other question is, uh, other forms of cardiotoxicity? Um, are there other endpoints that we can use that will have uh, value in terms of early safety screening besides the, the changing in the, the beating? Um, and then, of course, the big question for all of IPSL uh, drug discovery is whether or not patient-specific lines can really r reveal the functional phenotype in a meaningful way, in a robust way that can be used for uh, drug screens. Um, and with that, just the acknowledgments of uh, our group uh, within uh, NCS. Uh, Thomas Singer is the global head. Thomas Weiser is the head of global head of early investigative safety, and Kyle Kolaje is the, the head of our early investigative safety group here at Nutley. And uh, members of our lab here that contributed to the work are uh, Liang Guo and uh, Rory Abrams, who has uh, since left us to go to medical school. Say Kamioka and Josh, Josh Babiars, who has now also left us for other opportunities. And with that, um, I guess we can take questions. Blake again from Solar Dynamics. Um, and uh, first of all, we'd like to say thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, we'll open this up now to some question and answer sessions. I'll start with uh, just a little bit of housekeeping in that as Eric mentioned, both the movie and then a link to the uh, entire webinar will be posted on our CDI website, and the participants, the registered participants, will also receive an email with that link in it. So you'll be able to come back, see the movie, and review parts of the webinar. Okay, we've got a few questions here. Um, <clears throat> I think the first one we'll take is, is one that I can answer fairly easily, and that is, um, all three atrial ventricular and nodal heart cell types are represented, but what is the makeup of the population? And can the percentage of each cell type be manipulated? Um, right now, as uh, Eric pointed out, we're at about, the cells are at about 60 to 50 to 60 percent ventricular with an equal distribution of nodal and atrial, um, you know, roughly 20 to 25 each. Um, we have not tried to manipulate that yet, but that's pretty much the numbers that we see at CDI between batches. I should, um, just an aside, to my understanding, no one in the stem cell field has been able to produce uh, Um, atrial of interesting
happen. efforts at CDI, CDI being one of the groups that's looking into generating specific cell populations um, using our genetic selection. So a particular specific marker that could drive a type of selection for a specific cell type. Um, we've got another question here. Um, <clears throat> this one is for you, Eric. Uh, compounds shown in the IB20 list had primary effects on herd channels. Can the IB20 paradigm also be used to detect uh, channel block for other ion channels? Yeah, so we, we had uh, compounds that blocked calcium, HERG, and, and basically other ion channels, and we saw the similar effects. And um, honestly, though, not being a electrophysiologist, I wouldn't be able to go through and, and tell you the individual compounds um, how they fit within that, but I know that um, we were able to see the appropriate um, predicted response by using compounds that block uh, all the major um, ion channels. And we even were able to um, see disruption of beating in compounds that block uh, trafficking of the HERG uh, protein from the ER to the membrane. Right, great, thanks. Um, there's another question here. Uh, you spoke about lot-to-lot -lot variability. Could you speak to the well-to-well -well variability you see in the assay? Right, so uh, actually the well-to-well the -well variability is uh, minimal. Um, there, We did have some feeling at some points whether or not there was an edge effect around the plate, so the, the wells that were on the very edge of the plate um, oftentimes because of the differential evaporation uh, will behave differently. Um, and we prefer to use those wells as sort of the control, let's say DMSO controls. But in general, the, when a plate works, it's, it's uniform across the entire plate. Um, I should say that a lot of work was done in order to get this assay uh, work, working. Um, a lot of the work was done by uh, Rory and Liang in, in just coming up with the appropriate conditions to plate the cells in terms of the cell number, the density, how long they're uh, treated uh, or are allowed to grow uh, to get the stabilized uh, waveform. Because what's important to understand is that with this impedance system, you're not looking at um, the beating of an individual cell, you're looking at the coordinated beat of, it's not really a syncytion, but you could think of it maybe as like a slice of, of cells that have um, very close, uh, you know, uh, they're basically a, a confluent monolayer. Um, and if you need to have that entire coordinated beating across the well in order to um, detect these effects. Um, but the, the thing that's nice is that it's uh, once you achieve that, you, we have higher throughput than if you were doing uh, individual manual patch clamp, and and because it's all non-invasive in the in the incubator, um, again we can do longer duration studies than the traditional MEA studies. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think we'll do uh, one more question here. And this is uh, um, comes in, it relates to the the culturing of the cells, and that is um, where did that go? Yeah, how many days did you culture the IPS cardiomyocytes before you treated them with compounds? Maybe if you could review the the the, the preplate and the plating techniques you guys used. All right. So the cells come uh, cryopreserved, and they have. Uh, They've been quality controlled, so you have an idea what the planning efficiency would be. So a, a vial would say that you know this has uh, whatever 1.6 million platable cells, and what we actually do is we preplate them for between three and seven days. So we we thaw them out and we plate them in a larger format and let the cells recover from the cryopreservation, and then we passage them again into the um, Excelligence, I guess it's called the E-plate, the 96-well format with the, the electrodes on the bottom. 
And then after we package them, we let them go um, two to three days before we do the drug treatment. Now, um, honestly, for that was how our, our standard protocol was for the, the vast majority of the work that we published and, and that I presented here. Um, but we have done things where we would have cells um, that were pre-plated for sometimes a month, and then we would passage them and we would see a regular beating. So for us, I mean, it's important to sort of optimize the assay for on-demand screening. So if a, a drug team comes to us, discovery team comes to us and says, we want to test this compound, we have to be able to say um, what our turnaround will be. So that's how we sort of came up with this. Um, we we pre-play for uh, like three days, and then we put them on the exhalations plate, and then we, we do the dosing. Um, but uh, our experience has been that the cells actually continue to beat for a much longer time, and you, you may even get, you may be able to um, circumvent the things like the, the changing in the beat waveform in the individual lots if you have a longer pre-plating. But for us, it's, it's not um, logistically as nice if we had to plate the cells for two weeks before we could run an assay. Um, the other thing that we're you know, still revising and thinking about is our, our standard assay, we, we go out 72 hours. And this was originally um, done just uh, like a lot of things in the lab for convenience. We would dose the cells on Friday and we'd take the um, impedance measurements over the weekend and then terminate the study on Monday. Um, but looking at the data, it's very possible that um, we will reduce the actual assay time down to 24 hours in the future. We want to generate some more data um, and uh, see, make sure that, every, that we wouldn't lose information. Uh, uh, so I guess that's basically the, the different components of our, our plating. Uh, I should say we've had, we've had cells for months um, not in the exceligence plate, but in like a six well dish for like multiple months, and they maintain the, the beating. All right, well, thanks, Eric. Um, so if I just put one, one little plug here for CDI, and what, what we're doing, um, you mentioned about optimizing some of the assays, is working out additional conditions where we can really tighten up this pre plating and drug assay window so then customers such as uh, Roche we'll be able to have that defined rock solid robust assay window so they know that if a request comes in they'll get the data back to them on a, in a certain number of days. All right, um, at this point, Eric, if, do you have anything else to say or to add? Nope. All right, well, thanks very much and I, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, join this webinar and with that, we'll sign off. Um, any um, additional questions that you may have, please feel free to um, email them to the uh, email address you see on the screen. That's support at sellerdynamics.com. And I thank you again for your time. So take care, everybody. Have a great day.